in the universe, that accounts for just 4.9%. We don't understand 95% of the energy budget of our universe. We still don't know what dark matter is. It's a strong gravitational force in our universe. If you didn't have dark matter, our own Milky Way galaxy would simply fly apart. And we have to explain this. 4.9% of our universe is made up of ordinary stuff. The stuff that you and I and the Earth and the Moon and the Sun, everything we can see in the universe, that accounts for just 4.9%. So you might be feeling very small and insignificant in the universe, just one person on planet Earth, which is just one star in a galaxy, many, many galaxies. That may make you feel insignificant, but take it away from this point now. Actually, you are truly special because you are made up of the stuff in our universe that's really, really small and unique. So we're all very special. You can take that away. <laughs> um, but if you ask a physicist what, what they understand, electrons, protons, quarks, all of these lovely words that you know, that's just 4.9% of the universe. And the rest of our universe is dark. Uh, now, we've got 26.8% of our universe is made up of something we call dark matter. It's the strong gravitational force in our universe that glues our own Milky Way galaxy together. If you didn't have dark matter, our own Milky Way galaxy would simply fly apart. I want to focus on this stuff that we've called dark energy. 68.3% of our universe is made up of something called dark energy. This is just the name that we've given to some mysterious source of energy that's making our universe expand faster and faster each and every day. All right, so I'm, I'm not sure whether you're all familiar, of course, what dark energy and dark matter are really about. I mean, dark energy is, uh, well, related to observations of the fact that the universe is expanding, even accelerated, and we need then some substance that's spread over the universe that explains this. And it actually was already part of Einstein's theory along about a century ago that he could add this possibility of adding a constant that made the universe expand. Dark matter is a totally different phenomenon. It has to do with what happens in galaxies and the fact that there's more gravity there uh, uh, that keeps galaxies together, but also the formation of galaxies in the universe uh, needs dark matter. But that's an hypothesis. And it's true that most theoretical physicists and, and even cosmologists and, and astrophysicists think there's a, this particle out there that explains this additional gravity, because then you can do it with the existing theory. Why would you change the theory that works so well as Einstein's theory if, well, you can add this additional component and explain these phenomena? For me, the reason to doubt this is that there's a theoretical reason why maybe Einstein's theory doesn't work the way it does. And this has to do with our insights that we have been gaining about uh, gravity over the last century. After Einstein, we have learned about quantum mechanics. We've learned more about how the cosmos uh, works. I mean, at the time of Einstein, people didn't understand the, the, even the size of the cosmos, or the fact there were galaxies. So we were dealing with an old theory, and there are uh, reasons to believe that it need has to be changed. Uh, that comes from thinking about black holes, and even insights that uh, come from string theory, which is a field I've been working on, tells you that uh, simply representing dark energy with this constant of Einstein's theory, and thinking about dark matter as a particle is uh, uh, well, may not be the right way. Actually, there are reasons to believe that we should modify gravity um, when we are dealing with uh, the very large distances. I mean, like Einstein's gravity works very well when gravity is very strong, but in galaxies, when we are going further out, the gravity becomes very weak, and this is where the theory may be uh, different. And what I'd like to explain in my way of thinking about it is the connection between these two objects, the two phenomena, the dark energy and the dark matter. So dark energy is something that I believe is really there in the sense that there is a f uh, a s energy in our universe that is required to explain its behavior. But the dark matter is not really a particle. It should be a f an, uh, an effect of the, dark, the interactions between ordinary matter and the dark energy. So I have a sort of a, a mixed point of view on dark energy and dark matter, that I think dark energy is really there, but the dark matter should not be a particle, but it's some way that gravity indeed works differently in our galaxy, or in our universe, when we look at um, the interactions between matter and, and the dark energy. This is a very strange idea that, you know, something is causing our universe to get expand faster and faster. It's like energies coming out of nothing. So um, I compiled a list 
of all of the different things that it could be. And, and top on the list, to explain this very strange observation, uh, requires us to think about the physics of nothingness, which is a bit of a strange thing to think about. Uh, now, there are big regions of our universe where there's absolutely nothing, nothing at all. There's no particles like we're made up of. There's no dark matter. Expansive nothingness. Nothing. <laughs> Apart from virtual particles that can simply pop in and out of existence. And in doing so, they give the universe energy. And this is not complete science fiction. Uh, this has actually been measured in a laboratory. You can create a vacuum inside a laboratory, and you can measure uh, these virtual particles that can pop in and out of existence. It's something that comes directly from quantum theory and is well known about. And what happens in our universe, if we've got an expanding universe, we have more and more nothingness, because the universe is getting bigger and bigger. If there's more nothingness, there's more chance for these virtual particles to pop into existence, giving us energy, which causes the universe to expand even faster, and we get this wonderful perpetual motion machine. And it's a glorious theory. And could that be the answer to the challenge I was set? Unfortunately not. Because if you take the measurements that they've made in the laboratory of what happens in the, in, in the lab, uh, or if you take uh, the theories of particle physics, our universe shouldn't exist as it does today. If the physics of nothingness as we understand it was right, uh, our universe should have accelerated out to a gigantic scale long before the first stars and galaxies ever formed. So we can tick that one off the list, maybe. Um, so I've got a list here of all the different ideas uh, of what's causing the expansion of our universe to get faster and faster each and every day. Top of the list is this idea of nothingness, the energy of a vacuum. It could just be the particle physicists got their sums wrong. It happens all the time, all the time. They can't trust the particle physicists. Uh, <laughs> no, you can, no, but sometimes they do get things wrong. That's top of the list. That's what most scientists think at the moment to explain this mysterious dark side of our universe. Number two on the list, maybe there's a new weird force field in the universe. There are four fundamental forces that we know about. Four fundamental forces. Gravity, keeps you stuck on the ground. Electromagnetism, keeps all your particles stuck together. The strong and weak nuclear force, and those are forces that act on really, really small scales. Those are our four forces. Maybe there's a fifth that we don't know about. One idea that's out there. Number three, maybe Einstein's theory of gravity is wrong. So everything that I've talked about so far is all within a framework that Einstein got it right. Number four, the topic of our discussion today, the multiverse. And that uh, may be the answer to this whole puzzle of why we've got this weird universe that's accelerating really rapidly. Maybe that's just because we live in a really weird universe in a sea of multiple universes. And maybe that can explain all of these weird observations. It could be that the particle physicists have got it right, this energy is just coming from the vacuum, but we just happen to be in a really weird universe where the vacuum behaves differently than we'd expect. The question is, uh, I mean, we, we don't understand 95% of the energy budget of our universe. If I add dark matter and dark energy together, that's an enormous amount we don't uh, understand. We only, the laws of physics we've derived is only for this very small bit that we do see, which is less than 4%. Actually, we see only 1%. So uh, the question is, what are the laws of physics that describe the rest? And I, uh, my way of view viewing gravity actually combines dark energy with dark matter in one way, where you can even explain both of them. Okay. And so, Eric, would you say your theory is wrong if people do discover the particle? That's which right. Is so that's good. Not, that's okay. good. <laughs> so there's, I mean, I'd like to at least have that on the record. I have a <laughs> falsifier of uh, your theory. That's already uh, much better than, than any I mean, uh, uh, yeah. being said about string <laughs> that's theory. That's like excellent, yeah. I, I, if, if this particle exists, and if, yes. uh, if, well, if they can find that it exists, yes. does this then provide the missing part of the, the current theory which well, it, pr it, it provides the dark matter. matter. The yeah. dark matter, not the dark energy. One thing at a time. But it does... <laughs> it, it, it does... And, I, I, and it, I, I said it briefly, but let me, let me flesh it out a little bit. The dark matter really does look like matter. It does not look like a modification of gravity. You can relate the amount of dark matter that was in the early universe 
and governs the structure of the microwave background, the details of galaxy formation and so forth, to the amount of dark matter that we currently measure around galaxies and things. And it, they agree. You can, you can measure, you can consider the mass distribution around galaxies and whether it's consistent with a particle origin. It is, et cetera. And there are many details. Uh, so it really, and, and we have my favorite, the so-called axiom, but there are also other, many other uh, uh, candidates of conventional kinds of particles. If you work more or less conventional, if you work out how they would have, how many of them would have been produced in the early universe, it's rough, it's the dark, it could e easily be the dark matter. If you uh, calculate their properties, they have the properties of the dark matter. They interact very, very weakly ex uh, with ordinary matter. Uh, not zero, but weekly, and that's why we can search for them. But can I? Please, yes. So I, I completely agree. Dark matter is just matter. There, there isn't uh, anything mysterious about it. The, the only problem with dark matter is that there are a few thousand candidates for it. And, and no, we but need there are only a couple of good candidates. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> when you say okay, uh, with only a couple of good candidates, uh, okay. but, but we... When we you say a candidate for, for dark matter, what does you, that you mean? You can always well, write... She means what I said, that I think. That yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, that uh, it's something that has independent motivations. It's not just introduced right. to uh, address this, pro this problem of dark matter. It was introduced for other reasons uh, that are very compelling in their own logic. Uh, and and just and uh, has all the right properties to agree with what the astronomers observe. So the, the two avenues tried. I mean, the, uh, the, the dark matter came about by, by observing the strange behavior of rotational curves in galaxies, and 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 the two avenues. It's not models. It's, it's a bunch of models in each. But the two avenues tried in the community for for decades now are either modify Einstein's gravity so that you can curve space in such a way that you get the right rota uh, rotational curves, right. or assume that there is a very, a very heavy object there that is forcing these curves to, to be a certain way. The modified gravity approaches, are they w worth pursuing? Absolutely. It's always interesting to try and find challenges mm. and, and alternatives to a theory. But, but so far, for, for a long time now, they've really failed right. to, to match up with observation. And, and that's credit to Einstein's genius that, that his theory was, is standing up so strongly. So that leaves us with dark matter being exactly that, matter that, that talks so weakly with other particles, and that's the only reason we can't see it yet. Okay. Another, thing, another thing that's worth <coughs> mentioning in this connection is that there is known kinds of dark matter. Neutrinos are particles mm -hmm. that are very, very difficult to observe. The cosmological neutrino background has never been observed directly. Uh, and they do contribute significantly to the mass of the universe. So yeah. would that and if neutrinos had been a little heavier, right. they could very, they would have been uh, uh, comparable in mass to the ordinary, in fact, I think they are pretty comparable to ordinary matter and to the dark matter, uh, the, you know, the, 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 op the astronomical dark matter. For a long time, uh, people uh, thought that neutrinos, in fact, before the mass was known, people thought that, in fact, neutrinos might be providing the astronomical right. dark matter. Can I ask that you a question? That had the advantage that it was a known particle. That you can, but but in I any case, it shows that uh, very conventional particles can have this kind of behavior. Okay. Yeah. That was really so, uh, is dark matter uh, matter? Uh, I think yes, uh, absolutely. It's because we have tried alternatives and, and we haven't done that well in that direction. What remains with dark matter is to be seen. So then we'll know which of, of all possible models we came up with for, for this heavy particle right. that we call dark matter is out there. Now, having said that, removing one, one mystery out of the picture, we are still left with dark energy and, and the origin of the universe and singularities <laughs> in black holes and so on. And, and let's bear in mind just one thing. Uh, Newton's theory of gravity works amazingly well even now. If we need to send the rocket to space, we don't need Einstein's theory. Yeah, yeah. Newton's theory sure. is good enough. Uh, so what we, how, how do we actually see this invisible dark matter? So I said I've mapped out this dark matter. You, you're probably thinking, well, if it's invisible, how the hell has she mapped it? Well, what we do is uh, we look at very distant galaxies. Uh, light travels through the universe for about 7 billion years. 
And as that light travels through the universe, it doesn't travel in a straight line. Its path gets twisted and pulled by the gravitational pull of all of these invisible dark structures around it. And so what we do is we spend a lot of time on remote mountaintops, um, far away from all of the light pollution in cities, and we take very, very deep images of the universe. Uh, collecting all of this light from these distant galaxies, and then we interrogate that light to tell us about its journey, its seven billion year journey from that galaxy to our telescope. What we can do is we can work out how its light's been bent and distorted by all of this invisible stuff that's out there. Now, I said, you said, you know, does dark matter exist? I know that something's there. I know that there's something that's curving space and time that's distorting these images of the very distant universe that I map out. Uh, but I don't know what it is, but I know it's there. And uh, what we did when we, when we tested Eric's model was we said, okay, what, what would it predict for the gravitational pull around galaxies? And uh, when we started working on it, I was like, this is never going to work. This is going to be great. We're going to disprove this theory in a week. Unfortunately not. <laughs> the Margot, who was uh, leading this analysis, she was a fantastic PhD student in Leiden at the time, came up with these results and she compared our, our best model of what dark matter should be with, um, with Eric's theory and uh, found that it fitted our data equally well. So both theories fitted our observations equally well. And, uh, but what was important, and this is what uh, Sabine was saying, was that this new theory requires, uh, we say, no free parameters. So a, a parameter is, is something in your theory that you can use to twee tweak and turn the knobs to, to boost the theory or lower it. And there's no free parameters in this theory. And that was very motivating uh, and supportive of this theory. But I think, you know, Eric does, and team and collaborators, and indeed you've uh, written a paper extending this analysis, uh, this theory as well, and I think that's where we need to be going because you know, I would love the particle physics experiments uh, to actually catch a dark matter particle, or I'd love someone in CERN to create a dark matter particle because then that piece of the puzzle would be done. And you know, maybe that's just around the corner. CERN's uh, going up, going through an upgrade. It's going to be colliding particles together much faster with much higher energies than it's ever done before. Maybe that'll be enough to create a dark matter particle, the simplest theory that we think is out there, and we've got that bit solved. But until that happens, I think we've got to investigate new theories. To watch all the full talks and debates from these highlights, find the links below in the description and subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas.